Our speaker this evening is myself. Yes, I don't know. I don't know. Um, as most of you know, I'm chairman of Dorset Humanists, and I've been a member of Dorset Humanists for nearly 20 years. It's coming up to 20 years. Now that's longer than any other association I've ever had, apart from my own family. Um, and uh, there is someone here tonight who has known me for 62 years. So uh, great to see you. My sister uh, Marilyn is here this evening. <laughs> um, now, 20 years ago, I did have dark hair. Can you believe? You know, so I have it, being being uh, Dorset Humans, and particularly chair of Dorset Humans, has aged me. Uh, I'm afraid. Um, there we are. Okay, let's get straight into this. Um, that's enough of that. Um, well, my talk this evening is in three parts, as all good talks should be in three parts. First of all, I'm going to say a bit about my childhood. Then I'm going to share with you some quite lengthy extracts from an important book by a trans woman called Julia Serrano. You may have come across her book. And then we'll get into what I'm calling the trans revolution. As a preamble, I'd like you to know where I'm coming from. I was the founding chairman of the Dorset County Council LGBT Workers Group, and I'm the LGBT representative on the Bournemouth and Poole Holocaust Memorial Day Committee. I'm a gay man, and my gender identity is aligned with my physical sex, so I'm not trans myself. But I do believe that trans people exist, uh, and they have a right to be treated with equality, dignity, and humanity. But I do think the discussion around trans issues has become extremely difficult, and like so many other issues today, the debate has become polarised and rather ideological. I think we need to be able to have a calm and rational discussion about this complex topic, and I hope that I can encourage us to do that this evening. Okay, well, my own, a uh, little bit about my own gender history. At primary school, I was a gender non-conforming pioneer. <laughs> all the boys were put into the woodwork class, and all the girls were put into the needlework class. At about the age of eight, I asked my teacher if I could join the needlework class. I wasn't reprimanded or punished. I was permitted to swap classes, and a number of other boys followed me. This was back in the 60s. My best friend Jonathan had one of these. And I know one or two of you have still got these, these, uh, these little toys. Uh, an action man. But you know, I thought, I thought action man, when I, was, when I was about eight years old, I thought action man was a little bit too hyper-masculine for me. Um, so I asked Santa to bring me one of these. Cindy's boyfriend, who was called Paul. Does anyone remember Cindy's boyfriend? <coughs> no? Oh, you, yeah, you remember her. Right, well done, Peter. Did you have Cindy's boyfriend? I did, no. Right, okay. My sister did. Oh, right, okay. Well, yeah, yes, there we are, you see. Um, now, I did feel slightly embarrassed about this choice of toy. Uh, I realised he was intended as a toy for girls, not for boys. Uh, and I do remember liking this fur-lined jacket. And, uh, and he had some nice check trousers, you can just see the knee there. And I liked, I enjoyed dressing him up. Well, a school trip to Scotland when I was about nine, and my sister will remember this because she, she came on this trip to Scotland, was a fantastic opportunity for me to get into a skirt. <laughs> well, I borrowed a kilt from one of the girls and I wore it every evening to dinner. The headmaster recorded me on cine film doing the Highland Fling. Uh, so I did, in, in later years, I did see a picture, of, I did see a little cine film of me here doing the sort of Highland thing. I won't try and do it now. Uh, I expect the, the cine film has, has probably uh, disappeared by now. Well, when I reached my teens, I was experiencing some kind of gender dysphoria. Now, I didn't call it that at the time, but I'm calling it that within the context of this talk. Dysphoria just means unhappiness, the opposite of euphoria. It's not that I wanted to be a girl. I wanted to be more of a man. 
Um, now this is me in the church choir when I was about 12 or 13. I'm on the right with a lovely haircut. Uh, the boy next to me, Stephen, was a year younger than me. But his voice broke a long time before mine did, which was pretty humiliating. I was still a boy treble and he went up into the sort of the tenors. Um, and he was also sprouting <coughs> facial hair years before I was able to. I was incredibly jealous of boys who could grow sideburns. During the Queen's Silver Jubilee, I became rather obsessed with this young man, who was also a year younger than me. <laughs> Anyone recognise this young man? Is he sitting at the back? <laughs> not sitting here. No, I, I thought you would all instantly recognise him. Anyone want to guess? Awesome. Band of some kind? No, not boy band. Is it Prince Andrew? It's Prince Andrew. Yes. 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 <laughs> looking rather, well I think looking rather dishy. Um, Poor choice. But, but he's not looking quite that hot now. Um, anyway, we'll move on from Prince Andrew. Um, so, where are we? Um, now, if I could have been prescribed testosterone in my teens to improve my beard growth, I think I would have jumped at the chance, you know, if it was, you know, no side effects or anything like that. As it turned out, I discovered bodybuilding in my mid-twenties. And this was, I suppose, a kind of gender therapy, although I never really thought of it like that. Bodybuilding opens up the possibility of dramatic physical transformation. When I started going to the gym, the mother of my first boyfriend asked me this. She said, what are you trying to prove? Well, this fridge magnet is probably the best <coughs> explanation. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favourite fridge magnet. Um, but, of course, I must say, not all bodybuilders are gay. <laughs> Only the ones that wear little slips like that. <laughs> Okay, that's probably the fun part. Uh, we're getting to the serious part now. This is Julia Serrano. She was born in 1967 in the, in the United States. She's got a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biophysics. She's author of this book, Whipping Girl, a transsexual woman on sexism and the scapegoating of femininity, uh, which was written in 2007. <coughs> Now I'm going to read some quite lengthy extracts from this book because it's really important that we, we understand what it's like from a trans woman's point of view, what's actually going on for her, and I think it's very revealing. In the, in the book, uh, she uses this word cissexuals um, for people who are not transsexuals. Uh, you, you pop, you, some of you have come across this word CIS. Um, it's a Latin prefix meaning aligned with or on the same side as, the opposite of trans. But cissexuals is such an awkward word to pronounce, I'm, I'm just going to use the word or the term non-trans people instead uh, so that I don't get all tongue-tied. Okay, now um, I'm going to read some extracts from her book. She writes this, one of the most frustrating aspects about being trans, a transsexual is that I'm frequently asked to explain why I decided to transition. Why did I feel it was necessary to physically change my body? How could I possibly know that I'd be happier as a woman when I had only ever experienced being male? Most non-trans people have a particular blind spot about how someone who is born into a certain physical sex can, some, can come to know themselves as a member of the other sex. This blind spot has to do with what has been commonly called gender identity. I've always found the term gender identity to be rather misleading because it seems to describe two potentially different things, the gender we consciously choose to identify as and the gender we subconsciously feel ourselves to be. To make things clearer, I will refer to the latter as subconscious sex. So this is her term, subconscious sex. She says, I did not have the quintessential trans experience of always feeling that I should have been female. For me, this recognition came about more gradually. The first memories I have of being trans took place when I was around five or six. I had dreams in which adults would, te in which adults would tell me I was a girl. I would draw pictures of little boys with needles going into their penises, imagining that the medicine would make that organ disappear. 
Ooh. Sorry if that makes you wince, gentlemen. Um, I had an unexplainable feeling that I was doing something wrong every time I walked into the boys' restroom at school. And whenever our class split into groups of boys and girls, I always had a sneaking suspicion that at any moment someone might tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, what are you doing here? You're not a boy. I wasn't sure what to make of these vague subconscious feelings at the time. After all, I was obviously a boy. Everybody thought so. It wasn't until the age of 11 that I consciously recognised these subconscious feelings as an urge or a desire to be female. The first incident that led me to this discovery happened late one night. I found myself inexplicably compelled to remove a set of white lacy curtains from the window and wrap them around my body like a dress. I walked towards the mirror. I was a prepubescent boy with long hair and the curtains alone were sufficient to, com to complete my transformation. I looked like a girl. I stared at my reflection for over an hour, stunned. It felt like an epiphany because seeing myself as a girl made perfect sense to me. It became obvious to me that I actually wanted to be a girl and that on some level it felt right. Perhaps the best way to describe how my subconscious sex feels to me is to say that it seems as if on some level my brain expects my body to be female. Indeed there is some evidence to suggest that our brains may be hardwired to expect our bodies to be female or male. I'll, I'll come on to talk a bit more about that later. Julia uh, Serrano continues, Personally, I'm drawn to the brain hardwiring hypothesis, not because I believe it has been proven scientifically, but because it best explains why the thoughts I've had of being female always felt vague and ever-present, like they were an unconscious knowing that always seemed to defy conscious reality. I knew there was something wrong with me being a boy before I could ever consciously put it into words, and why I had dreams about being or becoming a girl well before I experienced my conscious desire to be female or feminine. Some people will object to me referring to this aspect of my person as a subconscious sex rather than gender. I prefer the term subconscious sex because for me this subconscious desire to be female has existed independently of the social phenomenon commonly associated with the word gender. I was considered to be a fairly normal acting young boy at the time and my female subconscious sex was most certainly not the result of socialisation or social gender constructs. For me the tension I felt between these two disparate understandings of myself was wholly jarring and I found my subconscious sex to be impervious to conscious thought or social influence. A little bit more um, and then we'll, we'll um, get into uh, some other um, aspects of the talk. So carrying on with, with Julia for now. She says, for me, the hardest part about being trans has not been discrimination or ridicule, but rather the internal pain I experienced when subconscious and conscious sexes were at odds with each other. I think this is best captured by the psychological term cognitive dissonance. Sometimes it felt like stress or anxiety, other times it surfaced as jealousy of other people who seemed to enjoy taking their gender for granted. But most of all it felt like sadness, a chronic and persistent grief over the fact that I felt so wrong in my body. My gender dissonance only got worse with each passing day. The only thing I knew for sure was that pretending to be male was slowly killing me. I was not 100% sure that transitioning would ease my gender dissonance until my first few weeks of being on female hormones. The way they made me feel and the subsequent changes they brought about in my body just felt right. I now feel at home in my own sexed body. Rather than living with gender dissonance, I now experience gender concordance. Many non-trans people have a hard time accepting the idea that they too have a subconscious sex because when a person feels right in the sex they were born into and are never forced to locate or question their subconscious sex to differentiate it from their physical sex, in other words their subconscious sex exists 
but it's hidden from view. They have a blind spot. It's possible for non-trans people to catch a glimpse of their subconscious sex. When I do presentations, this is, this is Julia talking, when I do presentations, I ask the audience a question. If I offered you $10 million to live as the other sex for the rest of your life, would you take me up on the offer? The vast majority of people shake their heads. Well, I'll let you just ponder that. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to sort of get you to, uh, to say one way or the other, but uh, we could try that later on if you would like to. Okay, well, that's some lengthy quotations from, from her book, but, but I thought it was important to, to give a voice to, to a, a, a trans a woman. Well, things have moved on quite a lot since 2007, when Julia Serrano wrote this book. I think in the last 10 years, it's fair to say that there's been uh, a gender revolution on both sides of the Atlantic. Some people pin it down to a specific date, June the 1st, 2015, when Vanity Fair published a glamorous photo of Caitlyn Jenner, formerly known as Bruce Jenner, the Olympic athlete, on their front page. Well, I'm going to simplify a very complex story by suggesting that there is an old paradigm and a new paradigm. Now, I want you to just bear in mind that this is just a way of organising some ideas. Um, this is not literally what, what has happened but I'm putting a certain, certain way of understanding this into a sort of old paradigm, probably going back to around about 2007, and the new paradigm which has kind of uh, become apparent in the last 10 years, or in the, maybe in the, even less than that, probably in the last five or so years. So the old paradigm goes something like this. So um, transgender people were often referred to as transsexuals, which refers to the processes, social, medical and surgical, by which someone changes their sex or certain aspects of it. They were understood to be suffering, I say suffering, from something known as gender identity disorder or dysphoria, sometimes described as being in the wrong body. And this condition is listed in the diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders of the American Psychiatric Association, known as DSM-5. I think, I think the term in there now is gender dysphoria. I think they may have removed gender identity disorder, but I'm not 100% sure about that. But rather like homosexuality, uh, it used to be classified as a mental disorder in the DSM-5 uh, until they took it out of, of, of the mental disorder category. In the old paradigm, um, people who are trans would be expected to go through a process of diagnosis, assessment and treatment, and this would lead to some kind of sex change or sex reassignment, and this would be understood in binary terms, male to female or female to male. There would be an expectation that they would attempt to pass in their new sex or gender. In other words, a transsexual man would look like a man and a transsexual woman would look like a woman, as far as possible. But there was also an understanding in this paradigm that physical sex has not literally or completely changed. You can change some of your external aspects of your sex, but you can't change your gametes or your chromosomes. I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Fairly obviously. And to what extent this is significant is something that we can discuss a little bit later. Well, a trans woman I knew at Dorset County Council fitted into this paradigm quite well. She was an older transsexual, and in a talk she said this, I recognise that I can never fully be a woman. So we could say that the old paradigm was a practical response to a human problem. Uh, but what I'm calling the new paradigm is much more political and ideological. So let's have a look at it. Well, the new paradigm um, has become part of um, something which has been, it seems to have been taken up into something called the social justice movement. Now, social justice sounds like the sort of thing which human, humanists should be in favour of. But social justice, capital S and capital J, is a political project which aims to eradicate identity-based oppression. It's sometimes referred to as identity politics or intersectionality. 
I'm sure you've all heard of the term white privilege and structural racism. So this is the idea that there's something problematic in being white and that all white people are somehow complicit in racism and colonialism, even if you're unconscious of it. I expect you're also familiar with the phrase toxic masculinity. This is the idea that there's something problematic about being male because you benefit from the patriarchy. You may have heard of heteronormativity. This is the belief that heterosexuality is the norm and people who don't fit into this box are disadvantaged in various ways. So if you are a white heterosexual male, you now benefit from three intersecting layers of privilege. Um, and now let's add trans into the mix. Um, we can keep on adding lots more, but let's just stick with trans. As I explained earlier, the opposite of trans is cis, C-I-S. So this is the fourth layer of privilege I'm mentioning uh, in this section. And there are some new words associated with this. Cisgender, cis privilege, cis sexism, and cis normativity. I hope you're keeping up with all of this new uh, vocabulary. So if you are a cis heterosexual white male, you really hit the jackpot with your four layers of privilege. I'm trying not to look at anyone in particular. Uh, okay, so, so what I'm suggesting here is that transgenderism is no longer a standalone medical problem as it was perhaps in this old paradigm, uh, but it's been taken up into this broader political movement called social justice or identity politics. And it has become um, rather militant, or perhaps very militant, uh, depending on your point of view. The new paradigm is also based on something called queer theory. Uh, queer theory uh, is an academic sort of subject um, and it seeks to, this is a, one of the phrases, disrupt binary categories such as male and female. So queer theory arguably is undermining the classic idea of transsexualism which is that you are transitioning from one sex to the other. If, if, we, if we're getting rid of these categories altogether, you know, what does it mean to actually transition? So there is a little bit of, uh, there are some, perhaps some contradictions in some of this. According to queer theory, these, these binary categories are problematic. So we get a whole load of new gender identities popping up, such as non-binary, gender queer, gender fluid, pan-gender, bi-gender, agender, and so on. And Famously, Facebook gives you 70 to choose from. Some people, some people say there's an infinite number. Okay, so we'll see. Um, see what you think about that later. There's also a large, me a large menu of pronouns. I'm sure you've heard about this. You can go with the standard he, him, and she, her. If you're non-binary, uh, you may decide to uh, choose they, them. Or you can choose from an array of new pronouns, such as zizer, and in, in titles, you can be Mr, Miss, Mr, Mrs, Miss, Ms, or Mux, MX, which is the latest one. I don't know if we have anyone called Mux here. It's unpronounceable, really, isn't it? Now, your sex is said to have been assigned at birth. This, this crops up a lot, this, this, uh, this particular phrase. Assigned at birth based on a quick inspection of your anatomy. Treatment is optional, um, your declared gender based on your innate sense is unrelated to your physical sex and there's no necessity to change your body or your wardrobe to conform to so-called outdated stereotypes. <coughs> your sexual orientation is based on gender identity, not sexual characteristics. <coughs> so if you are a cis lesbian, physically female, you're supposed to include trans lesbians in your dating pool. Trans lesbians are physically male. And if you don't like this idea, people might accuse you of being transphobic. Gendered words like woman have become problematic because the word woman now includes people who are physically male. And some cervical cancer services have taken to referring to women as cervix havers. So you'll, you'll remember that this is, this is uh, the whole controversy that um, J.K. Rowling got, uh, got sucked into, shall we say. 
the new paradigm has its own transgender remembrance day in November to remember all the trans people who have died or been murdered for being trans. Memorial days like this can help to raise awareness of prejudice and discrimination. But they also have a political function to increase the pressure for political and social change. And you may have noticed that Humanist UK has started uh, commemorating Transgender Remembrance Day. Now the last, uh, the last point on this slide is very important. <coughs> Debate is not allowed. <coughs> we hear so often these days um, of a whole range of issues uh, 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 yeah, we, we hear so often about a whole range of issues, phrases like, this is not up for debate, the debate is over, the science is settled, and so on. If you have doubts about anything I've just said about this new paradigm, you run a serious risk of being labelled a bigot and a transphobe. And maybe you are a bigot and a transphobe, I don't know, maybe we'll find out later, I hope not, but... Um, I, don't think, I don't think you should be labelled in this way just for having doubts and questions about some of these things. Um, if you're a so-called gender-critical feminist like Kathleen Stock or J.K. Rowling, you're likely to have four-letter words hurled at you, including turf, Nazi and worse. Um, I'm not going to use the C word, Lynn. Um, <coughs> Lynn, Lynn oh, uses the C oh. word sometimes. Um, TERF, T-E-R-F, means trans-exclusionary radical feminist. Now, it did start out as a kind of description, an accurate description of some feminists who think of themselves as trans-exclusionary. They don't include trans women in women's, uh, in the kind of feminist um, space, should we say. But the word TERF, you know, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like something you grab from the, the earth, doesn't it, and throw at someone. So, you know, it's become a kind of, it's become a kind of swear word. I think some of these, these words, to me, they act like fatwas. Do you remember the Ayatollah Khomeini, you know, declaring a fatwa on, on Salman Rushdie? So if people get labelled with some of these words, like turf or Nazi, um, because of some of the things they've said, what can happen on social media, I'm sure you're all denizens of social media, they can incite swarms of activists on social media to attack the offending turf or transphobe. Um, I've actually been attacked by both sides on Twitter, so I know I'm kind of doing something right uh, because I'm attacked by both sides occasionally. But I have also been able to have some very good uh, discussions on Twitter, so it's not all bad. If you get labelled in this way, you may get death threats and rape threats, and you may be physically attacked, uh, physically attacked, and even doxed. Keeping up with the, uh, <coughs> with the new lingo, dox, D O W X E Z, means having your address and employment details published on social media. You may lose your job and your reputation, and you may even be investigated by the police for committing a non-crime hate incident which will show up on an enhanced DBS. And I've read that the police in this country have recorded 200,000 non-crime hate incidents, but apparently they're no longer supposed to be doing this, but these things might still be on your record. Most corporations and institutions, especially universities, appear to have capitulated to this new radicalism because they're terrified of negative repercussions and they want to be seen as progressive and, and enlightened. So why are we not allowed to have free speech about such an important social revolution? Well, it seems to me that across a whole range of issues, you now have to have correct ideological beliefs to be considered a progressive, decent and moral person. And the people who hold these correct beliefs can have a very powerful sense of moral superiority and even a sense of moral duty to shut down dissent and heresy, which they may consider to be misinformation hate speech. Well, as you know, I've got a degree in theology and I've studied the history of religion and I can't help feeling that what we're witnessing is the rise of a new religion or a new sort of religious way of thinking about some of these social issues. Human beings appear to have a piece of software installed in their brain which makes them very susceptible to this, this way of thinking. And I think as humanists we need to be aware of secular outbreaks of religion 
as well as the traditional type, which includes belief in gods. Now, to be a humanist is to believe in freedom of thought and freedom of speech. And humanism as a philosophical belief is protected by the Equality Act. That's good news. Um, so we should be okay to practice our humanism this evening. Now, I do hold fairly progressive beliefs on, trans on, the trans on trans issues. Um, but I'm going to be raising questions about some problematic aspects of the trans movement and giving you the opportunity to say what you think if you would like to. My only stipulation is that we should try to discuss this in a civilised and respectful way. So let's talk about one of the most controversial slogans of the trans movement. Trans women are women, uh, and trans men are men. Um, with the added bit at the bottom there, this is not up for debate. Okay, and I just got this um, from a little poster I found uh, by Googling it. So what does this actually mean? Well, it could simply mean that trans women are women from a legal point of view. And I, I think maybe this, this might be the way tra uh, Stonewall, Stonewall thinks of it. I, I seem to remember that this is what Stonewall has said. Uh, but that's one aspect of it, that trans women are women from a legal point of view, and, and men as well. Uh, this has been the case since 2004, uh, the date of the Gender Recognition Act. But it also seems to imply that the categories about <coughs> man and woman no longer refer to your physical sex. So in the new way of thinking, your membership of these categories, man and woman, is determined solely by your gender identity or what we might call your brain sex. Well, this is obviously quite a radical claim and it won't be easily understood or accepted by most people who may be completely unaware of the fact that they've got a gender identity or a brain sex that is distinct from their actual body. Well, let's talk about physical sex. Um, well, sex is, is defined principally by gametes. Um, I didn't know about gametes until I started reading about this, um, but these are reproductive cells which produce eggs or sperm. Other sex characteristics include Chromosomes, um, so males usually have a Y chromosome, genitals, facial hair, body hair, breasts, voice, skeletal development, fat, and muscle distribution. Sex may also be defined by different dispositions, uh, interests, and capabilities. But I realise with this bullet point I'm straying into some controversial <laughs> territory, so we can come back to this later. Um, Let's ask some questions about sex. Um, is physical sex relevant to the categories men and women? Okay, let's... Um... Let's think about this question. Is physical sex still relevant to the categories men and women? Well, I'm going to stick my neck out and say yes. Um, I think the insistence that, uh, in some quarters that physical sex is no longer relevant is simply untenable. It flies in the face of science and common sense and it actually undermines the whole basis of transgenderism which is that there is a disconnect between your innate sense of gender and your sexed body. So even within the terms of transgenderism it's incoherent and self-defeating to, to say that, you know, that it's not relevant. Is physical sex real or is it a social construct? Well, some postmodernists like Judith Butler, she's an academic in, in America, are associated with the claim that sex is a social construct. But surely this is nonsense. Uh, sex has existed for over a billion years. I think we can say with some degree of certainty that sex is real. Is sex assigned at birth, or merely observed, or inferred? Well, one of the defining beliefs of this new paradigm is that sex is merely assigned at birth. Well, again, I think this is uh, nonsense. Physical sex is inferred from your anatomy well before you are born. Obviously, it's possible to make mistakes, but I think the obstetricians get it right most of the time. Is physical sex binary or a spectrum of possibilities? 
Well, there are a number of sex development disorders, sometimes called intersex, in which genital development is ambiguous, but it doesn't follow from this that sex is a spectrum of possibilities. There are only two gametes, male and female. There isn't a third gamete. Sex is binary. But at the, side, but at the same time, sex is multifaceted. It's made up of many different parts that we've seen, including chromosomes, gametes, secondary sex characteristics, mannerisms, clothing, emotions, innate sense. And real human beings don't always fit into neat little boxes. So we should avoid what I want to call, and I made this term up, ontological fundamentalism. <laughs> You've heard it here first. In other words, being fundamentalist about someone is literally a man or literally a woman. Now, if anyone uses this word literally, then there's a good chance that they are indulging in ontological fundamentalism. <laughs> so next time you hear it, you can remember my little phrase. Can you change your sex? Well, hormones can have a dramatic effect on your secondary sex characteristics. So the answer to this question is yes, to some degree. Is Julia Serrano a woman or a man? Well, she started out physically male, but she had a very strong innate sense telling her that she was female. She went on to female hormones, which changed her skin, her fat distribution and body shape, and her emotions. Beyond a certain point, people she'd never met before started to perceive her as female. She's not had genital reconstruction, but she said in the book, that her penis has oestrogenized, and I assume that means it got smaller. She identifies as a lesbian and she has a wife. So is she a woman? Well, this is like the Sorites paradox. Who knows the Sorites, have I pronounced that correctly, the Sorites paradox? Um, at what point do individual grains of sand become a heap of sand? Um, Julia Serrano has still got a Y chromosome in every single cell in her body, trillions of them. But so what? I think it would be perverse and frankly cruel to insist that she's still a man. So in this sense, I agree with the Stonewall slogan, trans women are women. But I think it's a process of transition rather than an ontological starting point. Now this is a picture of Stephen Whittle, Professor of Equalities Law at Manchester Metropolitan University. He was born female in 1955 and he started hormone replacement therapy in 1975. Now I think it would be perverse to insist that he is really or literally a woman. I think you'll probably agree with me there. Um, and this is uh, someone called Leith Ashley. <clears throat> he was born female in 1989 in New York. He transitioned from female to male in his mid-twenties, and these are the results. Fairly impressive, if you ask me. Um, it would be perverse, I think, to insist that he is still a woman, surely. Okay, well let's ask, what is... What is gender and gender identity? It's been surprisingly difficult to get a clear answer to this question, much more difficult than physical sex. And it depends who you ask. You can ask a psychologist, a philosopher, a neuroscientist, and you'll get different answers. Well, the main divide seems to be between those who think that gender is a social construct and those who think it's biological. The old nature-nurture debate. Well, I have to say that the science seems to be leaning heavily in favour of nature rather than nurture. And if so, this helps the trans cause be, rather than undermining it. So let's have a look at a few definitions. Now, this is, um, this is Gary Wood, a chartered psychologist and author of a book called The Psychology of Gender. And he says this, Gender is the socio-cultural and psychological interpretation of our biological sex. So the, I think the operative word there really is interpret, gender is an interpretation of our biological sex. So it's quite subjective. 
This is Kathleen Stock. Uh, Stock is a philosopher and author of a book called Material Girls, My Reality Matters for Feminism. And you, you may remember that last year she resigned from Sussex University following a campaign of intimidation against her by students. She defines gender as an internalised psychological representation of oneself conceptualised as female or male or as something else altogether. Well, maybe only a philosopher could come up with a phrase, uh, with a definition like that, but again, it seems quite, quite subjective. This is Nancy Kelly, uh, who is Chief Executive of Stonewall, an LGBTQ plus human rights organisation. According to Stonewall, gender identity is a person's innate sense of their own gender. Fairly simple and straightforward. This is Deborah So. Uh, Dr. So is a science writer and a former researcher in the neuroscience of, of sex at York University in Toronto. According to Deborah So, gender is biological. It's not a social construct. It's dictated by prenatal hormone exposure as opposed to coercive gender norms imposed on infants the minute they exit the womb. <coughs> Gender, ident gender identity is whether we feel masculine or feminine, and gender expression is how we express our gender. So she's making some distinctions here between gender, gender identity, and gender expression. And this is from her book, The End of Gender. Now, I I've read about, I don't know, 10 or 12 books about on this subject in recent months, when I got to this book, I thought, oh, I've, I've had a, enough of these books on the trans issue. I'm not going to read another one. And I thought, oh, I'd better read it. And I'm glad I did, um, because I did find it one of the most interesting. She goes on to say that um, social markers for gender may change as the decades go by. But this doesn't mean that children are socialised into having, gen having a gender. Men wore ruffles in the 1700s and boys in the Victorian era wore dresses. Blue was once considered to be a feminine colour and pink was considered to be masculine. This doesn't disprove that gender is biological, only that expression of gender changes depending on what is considered male and female typical. A typical boy, she writes, is exposed to high levels of testosterone and when he is born he will gravitate to mechanically interesting activities like playing with wheeled toys and related occupations in adulthood. The same can be said for girls who express high levels of testosterone. Greater exposure to testosterone in utero is associated with male typical interests, such as systematizing. Brains that are exposed to lower levels of testosterone are more efficient at empathizing. Girls show a preference for socially engaging activities and occupations, Preferences for people rather than things is detectable within the first two days of life. Girls tend to prefer dolls and boys tend to prefer trucks and cars. Well, I did like my James Bond car as well as my Paul Cindy boyfriend doll. Um, so I was kind of had a foot in both camps, I guess. Well, because I'm a humanist and we promote scientific literacy here at Dorset Humanists, I'm inclined to go along with what Deborah So is saying, but uh, we'll see what you think. Um, I also think that the biological basis for gender identity essentially validates what Julia Serrano was saying about subconscious sex. Deborah So says that many gender non-conforming boys, like me for instance, uh, will grow up to be gay, and therefore we shouldn't be fast-tracking children into transitioning. She does think that transitioning may be the right course of action for adults with gender dysphoria, but even here they should be getting good quality psychological counselling, not just a fast track to medical transition. Unfortunately, however, it seems that good quality psychological counselling is being framed as conversion therapy, and therapists may now be very fearful to do anything which could be perceived in this way. 
Now, um, I mean, Deborah So has been attacked, you know, quite viciously. Um, and in her book, she she says that she's been called a Nazi and and, uh, and transphobic and worse. But uh, I actually think her book is is actually quite supportive <coughs> of, of of transgenderism. <coughs> Trans a transition is, of course, a very serious business. It may involve expensive, risky, and irreversible treatment. If mistake if mistakes are made. Uh, we may get more cases like Kira Bell. Um, you, may you may have seen the news stories about Kira Bell. She was the trans uh, trans woman. I, I get this the wrong way around. Anyway, she was a trans person who I think sued the Tavistock Clinic in London um, because she felt that she hadn't been given proper counselling before going on to transition medication. So Kira Bell, um, people like. Kira Bell regret their decisions later on and they want to detransition. Now Stonewall claims that detransitioners are a tiny minority of about 1% of trans people, but other studies suggest that the number of detransitioners may be much higher and growing, and their stories are heartbreaking and poignant. This is Carrie Stella, who is a young lesbian woman from Oregon who started transition when she was 17 and she detransitioned about five years later. In her YouTube video, she says, she says this, When you go to a gender therapist, they don't tell you it's okay to be butch, it's okay to be gender non-conforming, to not like men. They tell you about testosterone, and that's about it. Talking about other detransitioners, she says this, most of us transitioned due to gender nonconformity. A lot of us are lesbians. I was put onto hormones at the age of 17 after three or four visits to a therapist with no meaningful attempt to process the issues that led in part to my transition. It seems like we could use a little more gatekeeping. No one offered any, any other options. How many other medical conditions are there where you can walk into the doctor's office tell them you have a certain condition which has no objective test, which can be caused by trauma or mental health issues or by, or by societal factors, and just receive life-altering medications on your say-so. She's been left with a scarred chest from mastectomy, a broken voice and a five o'clock shadow, although her periods restarted when she came off testosterone and her breast tissue has started to grow back to some extent. And she says this, I'm a woman, transition was a maladaptive coping mechanism. Well, detransitioners like Carrie pose a challenge or a threat to the dominant narrative, which is that you just know you're in a gender and no one should presume to challenge your subjective feeling, even if you are a child. Any attempt to do so is framed as, or may be framed as, conversion therapy. Well, as Carrie says, maybe we need a little more gatekeeping by therapists and doctors to prevent mistakes from being made. So what causes some people to be trans or to think they are trans? <coughs> Let's look first at the prenatal uh, environment or development. So this is, I'm just going to read a quick extract from a paper in the journal Pediatric Neuroendocrinology, published in 2010. I've only got the, the extract, or the abstract rather. The fetal brain develops during the interuterine period in the male direction through a direct action of testosterone on the developing nerve cells, or in the female direction through the absence of this hormone surge. In this way, our gender identity, the conviction of belonging to the male or female gender, on sexual orientation are programmed or organized into our brain structures when we are still in the womb. However, since sexual differentiation of the genitals takes place in the first two months of pregnancy and sexual differentiation of the brain starts in the second half of pregnancy, these two processes can be influenced independently, which may result in extreme cases in transsexuality. This also means that in the event of ambiguous sex at birth, the degree of masculinization of the genitals may not reflect the degree of masculinization 
of the brain. There is no indication that the social environment after birth has an effect on gender identity or sexual orientation. I can give you the reference to that academic paper if you'd like it. There's a, there's a Canadian sex researcher called Ray Blanchard who also um, has some theories around this um, which are quite controversial. I'm just going to mention them briefly um, without getting bogged down in it. Um, two, two, sub, two subtypes. Um, one is that he thinks that trans can be caused by a strong desire to attract heterosexual men. So, so for someone like me, for example, if I was further along the scale in terms of my gay feelings, I might decide or I might have decided that becoming a woman would be a more successful strategy for attracting a husband. But I haven't had to do that. My husband is here tonight. Um, now, Ray Blanchard... <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Ray Blanchard also theorises that some men are sexually aroused by male to female transition, and he calls this autogynophilia. Um, but it's a very controversial area, and I don't really want to get too bogged down in debate about that uh, this evening. What's more important to my mind is, um, based on Carrie Stella's testimony, is that there might be a whole bunch of other factors leading young women to, in particular to think that transitioning is the answer to their problems. It could be the onset of puberty, it could be body dysphoria in general, not liking your hips or your boobs or your voice, it could be societal misogyny, thinking it would be better or more empowering to be a man, it could be sexual abuse, it could be gender nonconformity, being a tomboy, it could be prejudice against lesbians, it could be a way to escape from mental health problems and the belief that becoming a boy or a man will be the answer to your problems. It could be social contagion, etc, etc. So um, there are a number of, number of um, possible factors here uh, in terms of causes of being trans. Well, as part of my preparation for this talk, I read this book called The Gender Identity Workbook for Kids, A Guide to Exploring Who You Are, 37 Activities to Help Kids Understand Their Unique Gender, aimed at primary school children. So gender is now something which is unique to each individual. The book informs young, uh, and needless to say, this is published in the United States. Um, the book informs young children that some girls have penises and some boys have vulvas and that transgender dads can give birth to babies. Needless to say, yeah, as I said, the, the book is published in the United States, but Stonewall claims to have visited 1,500 schools in this country, so I would expect the same kind of materials to be um, used in schools in this country, but, but I don't know, I've got no facts about that. Now, I think this book could have been helpful for someone like Julia Serrano, who had feelings of dysphoria from a very young age. But if such a book had been available when I was at primary school, I may have been invited to explore my gender identity on return from Scotland. I may have come to believe that I was really a girl and been encouraged to wear skirts more often and start thinking about a new name and new pronouns. After socially transitioning, I would be put onto puberty blockers and then cross-sex hormones. And what made me very angry about this book is that it completely ignores the possibility that a boy like me might just turn out to be gay. Okay, so why are some people complaining about all of this? This is my, my last slide now, so we're, we're getting towards the end. Sorry, it's a rather long talk, but there's a lot to pack in. Okay. Some people some people are concerned about the politicisation of gender health care and the elimination of different therapeutic approaches. So the therapeutic approach known as affirmative care has become dominant. But is it ethical to accept, to accept self-diagnosis at face value and without question? Have clinicians been bullied into this affirmative model for fear of being labelled transphobic? 
So I think these are just some questions for us to consider. Um, I don't necessarily know all the answers to these questions I'm, I'm raising. There is a lot of money to be made. Now this, this may sound very cynical, but there are at least 50 gender identity clinics in the United States, probably many more. The transgender industry in the United States is estimated to be worth over a billion dollars. It also gives charities like Stonewall a huge income stream. Stonewall's income is something like eight million pounds a year, and a lot of that comes from government agencies. So, you know, is, is there a profit? So some people are saying, well, you know, there's a profit maker here. Some of the loudest complaints are coming from women who are concerned about single sex spaces. Now, of course, the likelihood of a trans woman sexually assaulting women in a public toilet or a changing room is very unlikely. But I think this is kind of missing the point, because what people like Kathleen Stock are warning against is predatory men claiming to be trans. Where are the safeguards if anyone can claim to be a woman and just march straight into a woman's only space unchallenged? Um, Scotland seems to be going this way, the, the whole idea of, of gender self-ID, you know, and sort of almost doing away with all of the, the processes involved in it, in, in getting a gender recognition certificate. Um, but the Equality and Human Rights Commission seems to be putting the brakes on um, in England, and I was pleased to see the Observer uh, newspaper supporting the EHRC in a recent editorial. Uh, it can't be in the interests of the trans community to want to abolish all safeguards, I would suggest. There are increasing concerns about sport, women's sport. Um, some people think that the trans movement is destroying women's sport, arguing that people who have gone through puberty as male have a natural advantage over women, regardless of current hormone levels. So uh, we seem to be getting cases of men, men, male sportsmen, who are sort of middling if they're competing against men, but if they transition to, uh, to being a woman and competing against women, all of a sudden, you know, they're getting the, picking up the gold medals. So there's a concern there. There are concerns about um, children being fast-tracked onto puberty blockers, as I've kind of mentioned already. Uh, hormones and surgery without adequate psychological assessment. There are concerns that sex crimes committed by women are increasing when in fact the crimes are being committed by people who are physically male and these sex offenders are then being put into women's prisons. And I've read that 50% of trans women in prisons are sex offenders. So are they really trans or are they pretending to be trans? There are concerns that compelled belief is authoritarian or even totalitarian, uh, yeah, authoritarian or even totalitarian, uh, the idea that you're not allowed to even question these, some of these ideas. Um, there are people in the trans community who disagree with aspects of what I'm calling this new paradigm, but they tend to get shouted down by the, the more militant um, activists. So um, let's, let's just quickly sum up and then we'll go to Q&A. If the neuroscientists are right, then gender identity is formed before you're born. And in a small number of cases, maybe 1% of the population or less, gender identity can be misaligned with your physical sex. This may give rise to gender dysphoria and the identity of being trans. Trans people deserve equality, dignity, respect, and all the support they need to live fulfilling lives free of prejudice. And we, we have a, a um, quality and inclusion policy here at Dorset Humanists. But although it looks likely that gender identity has a biological basis, we should be aware of biological determinism. We should all be free to be gender conforming or non-conforming uh, if we wish to be. And just because some people are gender non-conforming doesn't mean that they're necessarily trans. Now, I may not have got everything right in this talk. You may agree with some of what I've said. You may disagree with some of the things I've said. It's a very complicated subject, and I'm still learning. Um, but we must be able to have a respectful dialogue about this contentious topic. So I'm going to leave it there, and let's have some questions. Thank you very much.
Yes. <laughs> sure, the, the, the the toilets thing. Um, I, I was just sat here thinking that that Lynn could say, I, "I'm a man," and go into the male toilets on male changing rooms and look at all the men. But gay guys do that all the time, and nobody seems to have the time. Oh, yeah. right, okay. And the same, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, women can. can it's, so, is, is this an issue? And in both the changing rooms of, of males and females and the toilets of males and females, there are usually cubicles for those that are just so phobic of anybody seeing their body, yeah. they can go in there. So, yeah. is this an issue, or are they just looking at it from the wrong perspective? I th the, you know, the gay thing is really interesting because. Um, you know, if gay, gay men go into male changing rooms and see other male men naked at the gym, and some of them are very, very fit, um, and, you know, um, I think probably, you know, decades ago, I, I expect there was probably an anxiety um, with straight men um, about gay men being, you know, in their changing room. But it's, you know, it's kind of, you know, John and I have been in, in the male changing rooms for years, and it's you know we've never been punched for you know um, looking in the wrong place or whatever. But not that we go in there to leer. Um, <laughs> maybe you can't help noticing sometimes, but you know um, I'm getting into very hot water here. But, you know, um, but that that was that's that's a, an interesting issue you brought up. So talking about toilets, you're saying that there are cubicles. Is it an issue? I went to. Um, I went to Bournemouth University the other day in my new um, role as Humanist Advisor at Bournemouth University. Not that I've done very much with that yet. And I just noticed that, um, well, the first toilet I went to was a unisex toilet. And I thought, oh, this is, this is the new university thing. You know, I expect all toilets on the university campus are now unisex. And I walked into this toilet and it did seem a bit strange to me. You know, call me old fashioned, but it did seem a bit. Strange. I mean, there weren't, you know, there weren't urinals with the gentlemen. It was all, it was, they were all lock-ups, but, you know, men and women were sort of, you know, mingling around in the, in the washing area. Okay, I, I reckon, I guess young people are just used to this, you know. Mm. You've never um, had that France, have you? And, oh, no, <laughs> France, okay, what do they do in France? They do that in France as normal, yeah. isn't it? It's yeah. normally in France. And, and a lot of European countries as well, yes. not just France. So maybe we're just a bit strange in this country. I remember, I mean, Oh, it just brings up so many things for me. When I visited our humanist group, uh, our humanist friends in India, it was a group like this, you know, um, we, were, we were talking to them and Swamiji was talking to them. The women were on that side and the men were on this, this side. So gender segregation was, was in, a, in, a, in a meeting like this. And I said to Swamiji, why, you know, why do you do, why are the men on one side and the women on, one, on the other side? Oh, well, you know, if we, if we mix them all up together, the men would be sexually assaulting the women. You know, that was just a cultural assumption. Um, I'm not really answering your question, am I? <laughs> but, uh, um, have I answered your question? Well, it's just an observation, really. Yeah. I, I think the, the trans people just worrying when, when, if, if that was explained. So who's, well, whoever, who's worrying? So the, the people who worry about trans people going into their space are worried about it, and yet this is happening yeah. by gay people all the time. And well, women. Well, it's women. Even if it's by men. Yeah, okay, so, so uh, let's have one at a time. So yeah. um, Steve and then, and then Peter. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, even if gay people do sort of look at other people in um, gyms and changing rooms, whatever, they've got to be extremely careful. You know what I mean? It's not yes. like you could, you know, you've got to be able to intimidate people because you can easily come over as a, you know. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Peter, you were going to say. Well, this is a slightly <laughs> different <laughs> point, Dave, uh, but it adds to what you were saying there. This is from um, a book by Helen Joyce on trans. Yeah. And she says a stealthy approach has been central to trans activism for quite some time. In a speech in 2013, Mason Davis, then the executive director of the American Transgender Law Center, told supporters, quote, we have largely achieved our successes by flying under the radar. We do a lot really quietly. We have made some of our biggest gains that nobody has noticed. And I was wondering why if all this is supposed to be settled and it's not up for debate. They've had to go for what Helen Joyce calls policy capture by stealth rather than 
debating it with the public at large to see how people feel? And if you had any <coughs> comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting that's an interesting point. So, um, yeah, the book that Peter is referring to is this one here, Trans by Helen Joyce. Uh, I found it very interesting book. Um, I mean, she's been attacked for for what she's written. Um, I mean, the, the legal situation did change dramatically in 2004. We had the Gender Recognition Act. So it's actually been the case since 2004 that anyone who is proposing to transition, almost regardless of what stage they're at, but if there is, a, if there is a, a, an intention to transition, then that person is legally um, permitted to use the facilities appropriate to the, the sex that they are transitioning to. And that's, that's regardless of having that piece of paper which says I've got a gender recognition certificate. Now, the, the Gender Recognition Act um, basically stipulates quite a long process in order to get that piece of paper. Um, and the piece of paper enables you to change your birth certificate, mm -hmm. to change the sex on your, your birth certificate, which again is quite a controversial thing to do because you know <coughs> clearly Julia Serrano was born a boy but has become a girl uh, or, or a woman um, but then she's retrospectively going back um, I, I don't know what happens in the United States but I'm just using her as an example retrospectively going back changing your birth certificate which kind of is sort of changing something right the way back um, that the gender recognition certificate enables you to do that but what a lot of the activism is trying to do at the moment is to get rid of the, the lengthy process that it takes to get a gender recognition certificate. So it's things like, at the moment, you have to live in your, your intended gender for a period of two years to kind of prove to the, the authorities that you're serious about this. I think that the, um, the people who decide whether you are genuine or not, like doctors and, and, and maybe a, a, may even be a, a legal person as well. And so it's a lengthy process to go through in order to get the gender recognition certificate. This is what activists are trying to get rid of, mm. so that you can just, you know, virtually go and go to an office, go, I don't know, go to the post office or whatever, say that you, you're, you are now a man or a woman, get your gender recognition certificate and you can, you can use it whenever you, you like. So it's the the um, EHRC is trying to put the brakes on that. And of course, they're now being attacked as transphobic for wanting to put the brakes on. So this is very, very controversial and it's all going on at the moment. But I think, just coming back to your more general point, Peter, I mean, I think um, to say something is not up for debate, when it is so fundamental, not only to 1% of the population, but to everyone, because we're talking about gender, gender identity, most people don't know they've got a gender identity, you, you know, you just kind of assume you're a man or a woman because of, of the body that you, you, you're in. Um, it's so fundamental, so controversial, and all of the things that I listed, all of the problems with women's sport, etc, etc, surely we should have a proper public debate about this. Now when, um, you may remember Keir Starmer was interviewed by Andrew Marr on the Andrew Marr Show, about six months ago, and Andrew Marr said, is it transphobic to say only women have a cervix? And, you know, um, <laughs> Keir Starmer sort of, you know, undenied about this, and he said, oh, it's not, it's not right, it's not right to say that. He said, but he said, what we need to have is a mature debate about these things, and I thought, well, that's the bit that I agree with. Mm. We need to have a mature and informed debate about these things. Um, what should he have said in, that, in answer to that question? Um, I think he probably should have said only women who are physically female have a cervix, but of course there are these, um, th there are trans women like Julia Serrano uh, who presumably do not have a cervix, <coughs> but, we, but we, we can say that she is a woman because she's gone through this whole process. So it is, it is complex. I hope I've sort of answered your Thank question you. a bit there. John? I mean, the thing is, I mean, the possession of a cervix is important for screening. Yes. That is the most important thing about that, and that, there's no problem with that. I mean, the other thing is, yeah. where, do the, where do these kind of awkward 
grindy moments come. We're talking about changing rooms and lavatories and so on. If you think about it, this is a problem because we are marooned in a totally adolescent mindset about the physical body. If you could get over the sort of behaving like 15-year-olds when you say, oh, oh, tits, oh, willies, we're still like that. If we actually had a grown-up attitude to nakedness, to, it, it wouldn't matter in the least what gender people were, or pre were presenting at. Why are we shocked if there's someone of a different gender in a certain space? It, only because we're still can, we haven't broken beyond being 15 years old. But Next John, you, right. but John you, went, you went to a private, a private school, public school, and you know it was all that sort of nakedness and all. You kind of grew up in a in a in a sort of school My environment. Privilege, sorry, uh, yes. Where it was, you know, sort of wandering around naked. It was there wasn't. You didn't have any taboos about well, we that. We did all wander around naked, but I mean, the, no. the point, I mean, in Germany, there are public spaces where nakedness of both genders together is okay. not problematic. Okay, but we need, we do need to hear what women think about this as well. So I hope I'm going to hear from women about that that issue. I've got okay, three. Let's hear from Corinne next, and and yeah, it's, Dan and, and it's Steve. Simple and easy. Corinne. It wouldn't bother me at all if uh, changing rooms, etc., were male and female. I really wouldn't have a problem with it, so that's yeah. my vote for it. I have a huge, huge problem. Bronya, tell us, tell us what your problem would be. Well, in fact, it's interesting because it was in the paper this morning, uh, well, one of the papers this morning, about um, the unisex at a theatre in London, where, you know, and this is it, uh, the women were having to pass the urinals to get to the toilet. You know, and, and then there is this question, Okay, for the sake of a few feeling uncomfortable, why do the majority have to feel uncomfortable? I mean, I feel uncomfortable, not least of all because men are bloody messy in the loo. <laughs> and I don't want to enjoy that. Yes. So I like male loos. I'm going to male loos occasionally. I think, thank God I'm a woman. Well, that is a very good point. Men can't piss straight, can they? They <laughs> make a hell of a mess, especially when they've had a few pints. <laughs> Okay, Bronnie, thank you for that, for that other point. Dan. I don't want to be naked either. No. I went to a public school, but we didn't strut around naked, and that was all girls. Okay, Daniel and then Dean. Daniel. Yes, um, you mentioned about uh, Facebook having 70 um, or 50 gender yeah, options, yeah. and um, whenever the topic of uh, you know yet another gender has been added to the long, long list of yeah. genders, there are always people who, who think that there's, we're on a big slippery slide, and and uh, where is society, what's it all coming to? Um, but I don't think anyone's really forcing anybody to remember 70 genders. Um, I think the reason that there have become so many different names for different kinds of um, experience, experiences of gender is, is that people who are, are trans do spend a lot of time thinking about their gender identity, um, and it's a complex kind of philosophical subject that does have to have a language attached to it in order to communicate it with other people who are in the same hobby. Just as Inuit people are commonly known to have 50 different words for snow, because they live around snow and they spend a lot of time talking about it. Yes. And I just Googled it, I found out that apparently in Scotland there are 400 words for snow. So um, I guess they have colder weather than even the Inuit people experience. Um, and also pilots have 10 different words for uh, clouds because um, it'll affect how your plane will, plane will fly if you go through different kinds of clouds. But no one's upset at where the world is going with, with all these horrible new words for clouds. We, we're still allowed to call them clouds. Yes. Um, yeah. But I, I think that that's the reason why there have become so many different words for gender, but no one's forcing you to use them. But people who are involved in, uh, in the subject do use them to talk to each other to make it easier to communicate and express themselves. And I don't think there's anything wrong with them doing that. No. Ask him to explain all 70 of the genders. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're quite interesting, uh, quite an interesting variety. But okay, thank you very much, Dan, yeah. that's a good point. Dan, just a quick one for you, Dave, really. if, if you just magically, you went to sleep tonight and you woke up in the morning and magically you had a woman's body, just a, a magic happened. You, so you, you I'm you supposed to be asking you that question. Okay, <laughs> yeah. You woke up and you got, yeah. oh, I've got tits and where did this come from? Yeah. yeah. 
um, and the, the actual like the sexual attraction that you've actually got anyway, yeah. fit would then fit the stereotypical body you've got. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you've got a you look like a woman, you fancy blokes. And all of a sudden, they all fancy me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but in that situation, you still feel like a bloke, don't you? I don't think I would feel like a bloke. Don't you? Yeah, but you'd still be you, wouldn't you? You'd, that, if, ever, if all that physical stuff went, you'd still got the, the stereotypical thing. That's why I get confused with this, because I think yeah. I'm trying to work out where the bloking has come from. I don't think it comes from the body. I just feel like a bloke. Okay, so you think, so Dean, so if you, if you woke up tomorrow morning with a woman's body, you would still feel that you were you? I, I feel like me, I feel, I feel like a bloke, I can't, but the point is, I, I'm trying to say, I think it's quite complex, because I, I, I don't know what it's like to be another bloke, all I know what it's like to be Dean. Yeah. So, is, is the, what the feeling of being a man or a woman actually is, because None of us experience it in another person anyway. So I'm getting quite well, if you were, myself, really. Yeah, okay. If you if you found tomorrow morning that you had a female body but you still had your male gender identity and you're still thinking of yourself as quite blokey. Yeah. Would that not create some kind of dissonance? Mm -hmm. in yeah, it would do. I'd want to get it sorted out. So, then so what would you want to do? You would go and have your well, I wouldn't feel like a woman. If, if it's still my, me as the, the... I'm going to use that word soul now, which I'm not supposed to use. Your soul. But do you know okay. what I mean? But that, there's that identity. Mm. I can't see. If I change on my body, I still feel, think I feel... I wouldn't feel like... And if I, I still fancy women, I don't think I'd feel like a lesbian. I just feel like a, a bloke with the wrong bits. How would you feel when you're having your period? <laughs> oh, I don't know, ask, you wouldn't be a bloke, you wouldn't ask my wife what to do about this, because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a diff, it's, a yeah, it's a difficult thought experiment, isn't it? it, and it is interesting. I mean, one of the things that Julia Serrano said, that when she, was, when she went on her female hormones to change from a man to a woman, her emotions changed. Now, this is quite interesting, because if none of us had transitioned, we only know what it's like to have men, men's emotions or women's emotions, and maybe we just assume that you know it's kind of normal because those are the only, only emotions we've ever experienced. But someone who's transitioned from male to female with with hormones, and you have you suddenly find that oh, this is how I felt as a man, and now I feel different, and these I'm, I'm getting different emotions mm. because of these hormones. That's really interesting that you then experience both sides of the, of the divide. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was one of the interesting things in her book. Simon. Well, this is the question about um, gender non-conformity, which could sometimes perhaps lead somebody to, you know, what, uh, what wants a transition. And that is, how much does our sense of male or female go down to the roots of power in sexuality, so that among men, there's a kind of pecking order with some very powerful guy at the top, a sort of kind of Arnold Schwarzenegger guy, or a you know somebody who's got so many attributes of being rich or sporty or something else that they're at the top of this kind of tree. Yeah. And so there will be people who aren't doing very well in this competition, or who are free even for ideological reasons might think, I don't want to be the richest, toughest, it just doesn't fit in my mouth, you know, so those people may be driven to non-conform. And similarly, perhaps with women in this kind of teenage uh, part of the life where, where these identities are formed, there's a sort of very wealthy, stylish cheerleader kind of girl at the top of the pecking order of maybe based around I can have power over men. All the, all the boys, all the desirable boys are asking me out. And there will be girls who think, sod, sod that, I don't want to do this competition, you know, I just want to do yeah. chemistry or you know, go, go running or something different, you know. Mm. So I, I wonder how far these kind of pecking order power dynamics, which in animals, I mean, the, you know, the most powerful bull or polar bear or whatever it is, mm. is the one that will get to mate and transform the whole future race of, uh, you know, they will have exclusive access to the females and, and how far it's 
not being able to cope with those power dynamics of sex that push a lot of people, you know, into other areas. I mean, all of everything you've said, Simon, is, is very interesting. I mean, are you suggesting that that maybe some of the some of what you've said is should make some people want to, to think that they sh they should transition to the other sex? So you, yeah, I'm saying it, it could, could be a motivator either to decide that you're definitely gay or a motivator to decide that you're, uh, you know, you, you desperately need to transition, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Is there any research on that? Any evidence? I mean, I, I, today I, I, I was, went to the church at Morton where where there's, incidentally, there's an incredible amount of activity, uh, of tanks sort of going around at high speed, making great noises that's kind of making me a bit worried <laughs> what the army is gearing up for. But um, the, the church, so I think it's the Frampton family, there are all these heroic characters who were killed in the various world wars. And then there was another Frampton who was the rector of this parish for, you know, 50 years or something. And you just thought, well, you know, he was one of the less aggressive Framptons who didn't kind of, you know, lead Britain into battle, you know, with somebody with a very different, probably chemical makeup. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, nowadays maybe that person would have said, well, actually, I'm gay, you know, or, you know, I'm not into kind of exercising my role by taking power in the world in, in the way that someone like Putin. So there's more options now to do. Like I mean, it's only, a, it's only a theory. Uh, I mean, just on the question of, of um, research, I mean, I think as this, this de-transition group of people um, becomes more evident, you know, maybe there'll be a lot more research done on, you know, what led them to transition and then decide at a later date to de-transition and maybe, maybe we'll get some better quality research. Again, it's quite difficult for researchers to do this kind of research because this is not debatable. You know, it's kind of not not debatable exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, a hand went up. Okay. Well, my, my, my Simon, hand up went Simon. up briefly, but I think you've lodged up to the question. I was actually going to ask about the progress of research. Yeah, yeah. Because presumably the, this, there is more historic research on this. <coughs> it, it can't have been come out of the blue. No, and um, I mean some of the people who've done the sex research, people like Ray Blanchard, but you know he's he's quite old now, and he's got these theories that I just briefly touched upon, mm. and those theories don't fit into this new way of thinking, you know. So he gets attacked, um, and it's very difficult. For, and Deborah So, I mean she left academia because you know it was just so toxic, if I can use that word. Marilyn. Just touching on research, yeah. I know that um, I heard on the radio the other day with regards to women's sport that obviously there is growing concern over that yeah. and uh, at the moment, I, I, I don't know the details, I can't remember, but obviously they have to, they have to take tests to see how much testosterone they still have in their bodies yeah. when they've um, uh, changed to uh, a woman, yeah. and they're yeah. thinking of the period of time as being much longer before they're allowed to compete. Mm. So they certainly are looking at that in a scientific way at the moment, yeah. because yeah. they're conscious of the fact that it isn't a level playing field as yeah. it is yeah. at present. Yeah, they, they certainly are. Because it's... even though there's been the sex change, there's still the advantages of the testosterone that was there Initially. Men are physically, you know, men have a different men skeleton absolutely. and muscle and, yes. and all the rest of it, yeah. 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 Anyway. Oh, um, <laughs> okay, lots of hands. I only have a really okay. small okay. Point, point about sports, which is that um, a lot of people who, um, who are in professional women's sports are, are actually intersex people. Um, as yes. Well. Um, yeah. Um, quite a lot of them are. Um, because there's kind of a sliding scale of how uh, feminine or masculine their genitals may, may end up looking and how much testosterone they have. Yeah. Um, and they do have an advantage, in a way, in, in women's sports. Um, 
Um, and I can, I can see why, why people might think that that would be unfair for people who are more, um, more naturally <coughs> feminine in women's sports. But then I don't think sports is a very fair thing anyway. I don't think I have much chance of ever being a successful heavyweight boxer. Um, and that you could say that's unfair, but it's not meant to be fair. It's meant to be entertaining to watch. <coughs> Um, I had another point, but I've forgotten it. Okay. Yeah, I was going to but that is a good point. That, yes, that yeah. intersex people. Yeah, where do they fit in the, yeah. in, in sport? That's quite yeah. quite awkward. Yeah. Aaron, when that started, I only have a small. I wonder where he was going then. Um, yeah, I don't know I if, if I, I don't know if people would would <laughs> give up their penis in order to be competitive at sport to never have sex again, never have an orgasm potentially. That's a massive thing to, to give up in order to go into something to get a medal on you. Yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone is. I don't think anyone is saying that in order to get my gold medal, I'm going to have to transition and get my penis chopped yeah. off. That, that's, um, that's not where I was going. Um, I, I like the idea that you said about brain sex initially, and I was yes. going to go off into a tangent there. But yeah. I wanted to ask you about the difference between being trans and actually transitioning. Are they the same person? Or do you become one when you've completed the journey? Or? So, well, I suppose we talk about someone being trans if they, if they have this very strong feeling, like Julia Serrano, that their brain is telling them that I'm a man or I'm a woman, but I'm in the wrong body. So that is the definition of someone who is trans. Mm. But transitioning is, okay, what am I going to do about it? Does that... Well, there were some people that don't transition. That was where I was going with Okay, that. So, so if someone if someone doesn't transition, what you so they can have this gender dysphoria, but they don't transition. Yeah. Well, I suppose they're still trans because they have that they have gender dysphoria, but they're not transitioning. So. Hmm. But they mean they, they wouldn't achieve their goal. They they might look no, differently and be no. treated differently, but they wouldn't be fixing the problem in any way. And this, this is one of the difficulties, I think, between you know, what I've characterised as the old paradigm and the new paradigm. So the old paradigm is kind of, well, if you're trans, you know, kind of get on with it and do your transitioning. But in the new paradigm, it's, it's almost as if that is an imposition, you know, and it's up to trans people what they do with it. And maybe some people want to be, want to say, you know, I am a woman, but I'm going to be, I'm going to present as stereotypically male but then that creates a problem it creates a problem for society in the sense of recognition because we you know human beings recognize sex you know gender instantaneously and we code people as male or female depending on their presentation some people might be ambiguous and I do remember when I was 13 years old with my long hair and my fabulous 1970s fashions being in a shop and somebody saying to the shopkeeper, oh, I think this young lady was before. <laughs> <laughs> I'd better butch myself up, really. So I got mistaken for being a girl when I was that age. Um, but yeah, but then that creates, I don't know, it creates social, a, a social problem in the sense that, you know, we use language in that way, male, female, because of the way people present. But if, if in this new paradigm we're now being told, well, it doesn't matter how people present, it doesn't matter what people look like, because the real male or female is in their brain. And that's why you have to put your pronouns on your Zoom call so that people know what you are. But then that, I think that's coercive to tell people that well, you must put your pronouns on your... I don't know what it's like in organisations now, but you know, if, if Lynn was still an HR director, she might be saying to everyone, you must put your pronouns on your emails. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but that's something else that's coming in. And I think, well, should, should people be you know, obliged to, to say their pronouns? OK, John. It's just, it's just an avenue to politeness, isn't it? I mean, what's the problem? It's, it's not a problem to... The politeness thing isn't a problem. It's it's the it's that your your brain is telling you one thing, but you're 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 having to switch polarity. If 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 John, you told me now that you're actually a woman, but you're going to carry on presenting as male, 
and I've got to just keep on remembering to call you she and her and your new name, which might be Jane, for example. It's just, all I'm saying is that it's a... Yeah, it's, 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 you know... Good old I say is thank you for caring it up. <laughs> but I, thought, but I, would, I would have to keep remembering. Oh, shocking. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm not going to win this Why Sorry? Why would you impose such a burden on somebody? I don't think it's an imposition. I mean, I don't like your point exactly. To me. I mean, I know that you know. I'm, I'm not saying we should. You know, I'm not yeah. saying we shouldn't. I'm saying that it. You know, it's. Yeah, yeah. there's a. There is a there is a kind of cognitive burden in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I kicked yeah. myself when I was with a friend who was trans, and I said Stephen instead of Stephanie. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I'd known her that way years ago, yeah. and yeah. I apologised because we were driving side by side, having a conversation yeah. and so on, and you know, I wasn't looking. These things happen. But, but if you know. but if if Steve had not transitioned at all socially, was still coming, you know, going out for a coffee, whatever, you know, and was still um, presenting as male, would, would that make, make it more difficult to, for you to make that kind of mental transition? I think, uh, can I just yeah. add to that? Okay, yeah, yeah. When you say presenting as male, that, that's what I was going to say. What I find really frustrating is you come so far with the gender issue, yeah, yeah. yet you still get, you know, told, oh, you're not very ladylike. You're not being very ladylike doing that. Yes. Why are you sitting like that? You're very yes. masculine. Yes. So if you present certain emotions that are deemed to be masculine, you get that as well a lot. Yeah, yeah. we're not allowed to discuss this. Yeah, yeah. But I have yeah. to listen to people say, oh, you're not very ladylike. Yeah. That, that just frustrates and, me. And <laughs> yeah, I totally, totally sympathise with where you're coming from there yeah. because we shouldn't be bound by these stereotypes. No, because what we is should be free to like yeah. in this. In this, you know, yeah. in this day and age, what's lady like? That's I, really old-fashioned. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> I totally, I I totally just think agree. What I mean yeah. is, why should we kitty. be yeah. put in that? You know. We should be free to be to express ourselves as as we wish and, and be. There's no such thing as you're not very manlike, are you? You're not being very manlike. Yeah. So we've put I've never heard we, we, no, we used to say you're the worst. Yeah. yeah. There are lots of yeah. insults. Oh, yeah, he's black. Yeah, yeah, but I don't feel it's quite the same. I think the thing is that it's interesting yeah. you said about the uh, testosterone in utero because uh, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't know it could vary yeah. within a, a woman's body. But um, I mean, I certainly thought I've had, you know, I've got more testosterone than your average woman, and I don't like women very much. Although I, I, I love being a woman, I love being a woman, I don't like women, and I'm very, very aggressive and very confrontational, and I like extreme sports. So, so you think you might have got an extra dose of testosterone, maybe, when you were in the room? Absolutely not. Maybe from all the vodka, my dad. Testosterone comes through the vodka. I don't know. It works. It's certainly we get alpha males who seem to have more testosterone. Yeah. I mean, it varies, doesn't it? It does, yeah. It doesn't yeah. mean they're not males or not females. No, that's what I'm saying. I would have liked a bit more testosterone when I was about 13. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a debate to be had about the relationship between the concepts of sex and the concept of gender. Mm. Uh, so you were talking about when you get the gender recognition certificate, you can change the sex on your birth certificate. Yeah. Uh, I understand that there is some uh, campaigning going on to replace the concept of sex with that of gender, and that would go on the birth certificate. So instead of your sex being male or female, yeah. then the registrar or somebody else will have to put your gender. But if there are 70 plus genders, or if it's a unique thing and every individual has their own, mm. who decides what gender to go in on yeah, the best well, gender? precisely. And how, and how would you know if it's something in deep in the brain? Mm. The baby is not going to be telling you that age, is no, it? No, but maybe at some point we will we will get to the point where you, you have a little um, 
gender swab test and you stick something up your nose <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then you drop it onto a little thing and then it gives you your readout and you will know whether you're a man or a woman. How does this work in a hospital ward where you'd have to go and have a gynecological problem but you're, you've got man bits but you're identifying as a woman? So surely the birth certificate would be required then to say, and, I've yeah. got these parts. And this is one of the things that has been raised in that, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know the specific details, but uh, I have read about cases where someone has gone into hospital, they are, it says on their records that they are male or female or whatever, but actually their birth sex is the other sex. And the, the medics are, are not treating that person in the right way because men and women have different medical needs and medical yeah. conditions and, and different um, susceptibilities. So the medical, the NHS needs to know what your physical sex is as well as your gender identity. So it does get very complicated. Can I just ask, did you correct the person in the shop about your sex? No, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> Yeah, I just thought I'd better get my hair cut <laughs> and not, not wear such outrageous um, 70s clothes. I remember what I was wearing. I was wearing um, mint green flares, which were like that one, and I had a sort of stripy, velvety green top. It was absolutely fabulous, but probably did look a bit good. Did look a bit good, yes. Yeah, I was just wondering, you mentioned a bit in there about um, pressure on some people to maybe transition or change their sex to, to attract somebody of the opposite sex, and how, how you might have thought, is there pressure on the ideas of same-sex relationships? Um, in fact, and people still want to maybe, even a gay couple or a lesbian couple, they assume that maybe one of them's more butch or more feminine than the other, and they still can't get their head around people, two people being the same as such. And is there, do you still think there's pressure on one person maybe to be more feminine or, or more masculine as such, you know? Um, I don't know, but you know, what worries me is obviously in places like Iran, when where gay men are actually expected to transition, you know, to female because you know that kind of deals with the problem. Yes. Uh, and if and if this new paradigm is somehow replicating that in yeah. Western societies, that you know, that is a concern. Yeah. You know, there's uh, there is a there is a concern there. Yeah, like you can't be gay and the same, so you've got to turn into a woman. To sort of so one, yeah. So one of the questions is, you know, is some of this being driven by homophobia? You know. Yeah. Um, it's a question. Yes, Simon, and then Corinne. Yeah. So yes, I, I, I thought it was really interesting the, the, the bit where you were talking about the prenatal uh, influences on sexuality. And I read somewhere, I heard it on the radio, that um, just to take boy children, boy male babies, that the birth order is quite important, that there's more testosterone in, in the sort of oldest child, but there's a kind of battle that goes on between the estrogen of the mother and the testosterone of the boy child. Yes. Um, and so that later children, they may have less testosterone because, you know, the female, you know, I, 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 I don't know the facts of it, but, but it shows that there could be, you know, a whole sliding scale of how many of these chemicals one is yeah. Does anybody know anything yeah, about that? Yeah, I, I, I don't know the precise facts about that, but I think there is, I've certainly read about that. I mean, I'm sure it's not the case that all mm. gay men are the last, the last born, but I was the fourth and the last. I was my mum's little baby, you know. <laughs> um, so maybe I didn't, maybe she didn't have enough testosterone, you know, for me when I came along. But, well, who, who knows? But yeah, that was that is interesting that I that I fit into that, but that's not true of every of all gay men. <laughs> I know. So. John, it was just we don't question the fact that it's considered essential to define a sex at birth, but doing so must surely be as to, must to some extent be due to the fact that way back the advantage of being male in terms of inheritance 
power position in society was absolutely essential to establish. I mean, it would be, straight, it would be interesting to have birth certificates in which the sex was simply not recorded because society has moved on mm. towards an equality where gender for legal purposes and inheritance and superiority of social position no longer is a question. It's an interesting question, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Okay, I'm just going to leave that one uh, hanging in the air. People can think about it. We will wrap up in a minute, um, but yeah. Um, Corinne was first, and then I'll get to you, Betty. Corinne, are you still asked the question? It's just very brief, and it's not a question. It's just that I can tell you that 30-odd years ago, I went to a party, and there were transvestites there. It was so interesting that I actually got to talk with them and understand a little bit of how they were. It, it was fascinating, absolutely, and that was 30 odd years ago. So I just thought I'd mention that because anyone else has actually met people who are. Many, yeah. many, many. Yeah, yeah. Many cross dresses, yeah. many yeah. trans. And yes, yeah. We don't get to 70 without meeting a few. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. I'll bear that in 75, actually. Bessie. No, I was thinking to say, um, in reply to John, really, you'd have to move on an awful long way before they didn't say automatically in the minute, is it a boy or a girl? <laughs> yes, yeah, Bessie was a midwife. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bessie, did you ever make mistakes? I mean, there were times when you weren't sure. Yes. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. Yeah, now gender reveals are all the rage, aren't they? Gender reveals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Last one then, Dan. Yes, um, I think I can see why some people find it quite um, uncomfortable to, to hear the word they to uh, use to refer to a single person yeah. because we have quite a gendered language. Um, but I wonder if a French person would find it uncomfortable to hear us talking about the sun and the moon without talking with about them, those things being mm. male and female, because they yes. are male and female in French, which is really good French poetry, because it means they can add a kind of romantic uh, context to things that, that, um, that are just objects. But then if you look at Chinese, um, when Chinese people talk about other people, they don't refer to them as he or she, they, they use a singular they, although it's not the word they, it's in Chinese, um, mm. but they, they just use a word that's, you know, that person or those, those people, and it, it's, it's perfectly well understood. And then if Chinese people learn English, it's quite common for them to make an early mistake, which is that they'll switch between saying he or she when they're talking about a specific person. Mm -hmm. So they haven't yet remembered which one is which. They, they do know when they look at the person that they're a man or a woman. Yeah. Um, it's not that they don't actually know. It's just that it's not really part of the language in the same way as we might struggle to uh, attach the male and the female pronouns to objects if we learn French. Um, and I'd be interested to see whether there's a higher or lower inc incidence of people being transgender in countries like China, though I don't know if it's legal in China, but, you know, places where it's not that big of a deal um, yeah. in terms of the way you speak about people. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you make a very good point about language and some of the difficulties that we, that we have are, are just about the language that we use. Um, and um, apparently in Sweden, or in Swedish, there isn't a distinction between sex and gender, so how do they get on with this debate? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, Very last week. Um, th this month, a survey in America said that Generation Z children, uh, and young adults from 16 to 25 something, 20% uh, are now LGBT. I thought it was more than that. Wow. Yeah, I remember. So 25. <laughs> they've been reading that book, I'm yes. surprised it's not 100%. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's multiplying. <laughs> I was going to ask you, David, on that score. So, am I the last one here? <laughs> You're after the end, but go on. Go oh, on. sorry about that. That's no. fine. Um, this increase in the number of options that are available to adolescents, malleable adolescents, yeah. do you think culturally uh, the, the amount, the number of options that are now available to them is just confusing them more than they are already? I don't know. You'll have to... <laughs> You'll have to ask them. I don't know. I don't know. I, th I think, well, I mean, you know, Aaron has mentioned Generation Z, as we're supposed to call them, Gen Z. Um, I think all, all of this is quite sort of normal. 
to them. But yeah, as, a, as you say, it's maybe because they've been reading oh, those kind of books. Maybe they've been reading those kind of books. Yeah. But then, you know, you, if you go back, if you go back to the 70s, you know, David Bowie and um, you know, then Boy George and Marilyn. I mean, there was all of that gender bending going on anyway. And it's, it's not. It was going on anyway, wasn't it? Just, a, just different, a slightly different. Well, let's wrap up, Lynn. Um, yes. Well, normally, of course, you chair these meetings, and at the end, you give some fulsome praise to the speaker for their presentation. So. I was thinking, oh dear. <laughs> anyway, I have to say, absolutely fascinating yes, talk. I, yeah. I think um, it's something, it's so healthy to talk about the different aspects of this and, uh, and, the, and the issues involved. And I see it in a much wider perspex now than I, I did um, earlier. But um, to sort of see the, the different issues that we're all going to have to deal with when we're meeting with people who still have certain you know, set ideas in, in this area that, um, you know, there's there's no battle to be had. It's just an open world where, you know, we're all a little bit different in all these different ways and no, sexuality true. and uh, training. And um, I think we need to talk more and more just to sort of learn acceptance and understanding and the, and the way we work. So I thought that this talk really, um, yeah. I thought, covered every aspect of it. And I have to say, absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much yeah. indeed. Thank you. Fantastic audience, and, and I think we've done done the subject justice. And I think we've managed to be, you know, to do it respectfully. You know, and if, if there were trans people here tonight, or if there are any trans people listening when this, this goes out on recording, I hope that we've done it in a respectful way. <laughs>